Hallelujah. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> so, uh, I don't normally pray for a word to start the new year, and let me explain why. I know it's popular, um, but our calendar was invented by the Romans. God didn't actually invent our calendar, right? He had his own calendar that you can find in the first five books of the Bible. He didn't actually invent this one. The Romans did a better thing. And, uh, and so many people think that, you know, because, hear what I'm saying, because it's January 1st, God has to speak and give you vision for the next 365 days. You could do that on June 3rd if you wanted. You could wake up one day and say, for the next year, I would like to live out a vision. Give me a vision, Lord, for the next month, six months, year, five years, right? So God doesn't have to speak uh, just because we have a new year. But this year, I felt impressed to seek the Lord for a word for the year. The Spirit was really drawing me. He wanted to tell me something. So um, I was really, uh, I, was, I was leaning in for a word for the year, and the be- Lord began to speak to me. And the Lord told me, uh, 2020. I said, yes, Lord. That is the year, 2020. I, I thank you. We're on the same page now. Would, it, would you have a word for me? He goes, yes. 2020 vision. I said, no, Lord. No, that's cheesy. I cannot do that. There's trucking companies that have 2020 vision for this year. I just, I need to, I I want a prophetic word from you. And he said, yes, 2020 vision seen clearly. I was like, yeah, no, I heard that already. I understood what 2020 meant. That's, I just, there's no way I'm standing in front of the church and saying the the vision for this year is 2020 vision. I just, I'm not going to do that. And he's like, then he was quiet. You ever like so hungry for a new word, you had to just settle on what God's already said? Like, I guess I just got to go with what you said, God, right? <laughs> I tried everything else. I guess I'm stuck with just, you know, God, right? Like, <laughs> I guess I'm just going to go with God. So I wrote it down. The word for the year is 2020 vision. Then the Lord began talking to me. He said, turn to Acts chapter 20. And I did. And this is what we're going to read this morning. Acts chapter 20, we're going to get a running start in verse 18. Amen? Oh, no, no. See, you're going to have to be with me here this morning. Amen. We're going to have to be here together this morning. We're going to have to be here together this morning because uh, I'm going to talk and I need you to kind of draw a little bit. Otherwise, I get self-conscious and I just, I'll start talking pointlessly and I don't want to do that, right? I want to, I want to bring the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right, here we go. That was a test. That was a test. <clears throat> Shabbat. We're going to, mm, hallelujah. Acts chapter 20. Wow. Mm, how about that? Wow. I'm going to stand over here for a second so I can read Shaba. Was anybody here Friday night? It was amazing. The burning room was amazing Friday night. I feel like some of it's still lingering right now. So good. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 20, we're starting verse 18. <clears throat> this is Paul speaking. And uh, he, he's about to, uh, he's about to leave here. And he's telling them, you, know, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot, foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time serving the Lord with all humility. Wow, I'm sorry. Serving the, mm, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. Verse 20. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that... Mm. Okay, here we go. I'm, if, you, if you're a guest, I'm, the Holy Ghost is messing with me here. And uh, this isn't God, this is me trying to adjust with Him being His hand upon me. How I... Mm. Amen. You're with me here, yeah? We're together? Say, that's all right, Carl. Work it out. We'll wait a second. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. How I did not shrink from declaring... Hmm. Shabbat. Hmm. He's here, by the way. Here we go. So I'm just trying to share him a little, just to get off me so I can read the Bible. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable... And teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Let's unpack that for a second if we could. <clears throat> huh. God is, um, huh. Huh. let me tell you one of, the, one of the things I love the most about pastoring a small church. Um, what, what, what. One of the things I love the most is that we get to live life together. Like, I actually live life with people. I actually know what's going on in your lives. I know when you're on vacation. get to celebrate the birth of children. And and, and just, we we, 
we get to live life together. I really, really, really enjoy that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, what's really good about living life together is I get to hear God together with people. I'm not just stuck on my own hearing God, and you're not stuck on your own hearing God. I get to hear God with people. And the conversation with God is so more rich when I hear it through multiple voices. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I get to hear it through God, you know, my experience with God in my life. And I also get to hear it through my, my scripture reading, of course. And I get to re- hear it through, you know, my wife's voice, of, of course. Uh, the wise man said, I heard the voice of God and it sounded like my wife. Amen. <clears throat> <laughs> but I get to hear God together with people. And the conversations I have with people and what they're wrestling with God is often what God is talking to me about. Now, about two months ago in the burning room, Corey got this song. And it, and it really um, surmised what God had been speaking to me. And, and the song was, There's a Wave Coming. There's a wave coming. Better get ready. Better get ready. There's a wave coming. Now, <clears throat> I was part of a church a number of years ago. Uh, actually, why I moved to Boca Raton was to help plant the church. And this church had a prophetic word about a tsunami coming. And uh, they were pretty excited about this tsunami that was coming. And they put it on the front of the bulletin that this tsunami, they had a picture of the tsunami. And people were like, wow, you guys are really holding on to this word. I don't know if you've ever been any place there's been a tsunami. Uh, but that's not really something you want to encounter. If you look where tsunamis go, you don't see anything after the tsunami passes through, right? And so um, I I, I began asking questions like, hey, I know we heard there's a tsunami coming. Perhaps that's not good. Perhaps, like, you know, I lived in uh, in Alaska for a season, and um, I lived on an island um, in southeast Alaska, and we had a tsunami alarm. And anytime there was an earthquake off the, off the shore, um, the tsunami alarm would go off. In the middle of the night, it would just ring out super loud, and they had the sirens everywhere. And so if you heard the tsunami alarm, you had to get out of your house and get to high ground because the wave would come and destroy everything in its path. And you remember the, the several tsunamis that have happened in the last uh, many years. Uh, remember when it struck Asia and the whole Pacific Rim, and there was just destruction and, uh, and so, um, from having lived, I think I was the only person in that church who had lived in a place where there were tsunami warnings, I was like, I don't hear anything good when you say tsunami. Nothing, in, nothing encouraging happens in me internally. And I don't see anything in nature that says tsunami is a good thing. And I was like, perhaps we should pray and ask, you know, what should we do about the coming tsunami, Lord? You see, when the Lord said a tsunami comes, it's time to get the higher ground. It's time to get the higher ground. Better figure out where we're in the low ground and come up to some higher ground. Right? Amen. Right? Like this, <clears throat> that church, of course, is not here any longer. Um, it most certainly got something came and it was destroyed. And so, um, fortunately, the song came forth. There's a wave coming. Now, we live on the coast. The guy who got the song likes to surf. And if you're in Boca del Rey, a wave coming is a very good thing because we just don't get a lot of waves, right? So a wave coming is positive, right? We want waves. We want the ocean. And nowadays, you know, like you can harness the power of waves. They turn waves into electricity, all kind of things. But the Lord told us there is a wave coming. You better get ready. Better get ready. And so... The wave that's coming is going to be familiar but different. It's going to be something similar that we've seen in the past, but it's going to be different than what we've experienced before. And um, I, I, I am a Pentecostal, right? Now, Pentecostals, Corey and I are Pentecostals. Corey, myself, and Pastor Tracy are Pentecostals. Samuel, myself, Duke, Corey, and Pastor Tracy are Pentecostals. Hallelujah. Mike Rentler, Corey Pagano, Duke, Sam Reynoso, Chelsea, and my wife are Pentecostals, right? And and let me just explain this really quickly. There's people who um, 
Shabbat. Pentecostals believe in the baptism of the Spirit and the primacy of the, of the Spirit in our life, right? There are a group of Pentecostals who also um, are kind of legalist. Well, not kind of legalist. They are legalists, right? And they really embrace the term Pentecostal, but not every Pentecostal is a legalist. Also, not every legalist is a Pentecostal, right? So there's a whole big section of people who really proudly call themselves Pentecostals, and women aren't allowed to cut their hair or wear pants or be equal, right? Like, <laughs> And so, and so, so that, that, that's not us so much, right? That's not us at all, actually. Um, now, since I am a Pentecostal, uh, many, many times the church was, was kind of embarrassed of our Pentecostal roots and the legalism that went down it, so we started calling ourselves charismatics. Now, the charismatics were people who were in high church who began experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Lutherans and the Catholics, uh, when, the, when the outpouring of the Spirit began to happen in the late 60s, into the 70s and 80s, and really a high point in the 90s, many of these high church people were getting, were getting the Spirit, and they began calling themselves charismatics because they started experiencing the charisma of the Spirit. Are you with me? And so, so many Pentecostals were embarrassed of their Pentecostal roots. They ran from it and started calling themselves charismatics, and now they just call themselves non-denominational. Like, that's a new thing. We don't even talk about the Holy Ghost at all. We're non-denominational. Like, that's not even a theological statement. That just means you're not in a denomination. I mean, you could, you could be a cult, and you're technically non-denominational, right? Like, because no denomination would have you, right? Like, so, so non-denomination doesn't tell you anything, right? I'm Pentecostal. Since I'm Pentecostal, and that's who I, I can criticize us charismatic, Pentecostal, spirit-filled folks. That's where I have authority. I don't have authority to tell the Catholics how to do church. I don't have authority to tell um, the, the evangelicals how to do church. I'm a Pentecostal. And, and one, of the, one of the real weaknesses of the Pentecostals in the last 25 years um, ha- has been that we have, um, <clears throat> we have surrendered the authority of the Scripture to evangelicals. Does that make sense? Um, th- th- there's such a, a wave of the Holy Spirit came in um, that certain parts of our Pentecostal roots not only became non-centered in Scripture, but even anti-intellectual. And so you see a lot of um, these people who, who um, are scared of science. You would think almost that they're scared of books, right? Like, <laughs> unless they're selling it at a conference, right? Anybody who's actually went to school to write a book is to be suspect but anybody who's writing a book based on, I don't know, learning, they weren't as excited about. <clears throat> and so I believe what, what's coming is what, um, what Leonard Sweet calls the holy braid. The holy braid. And the holy braid, as he sees it, is um, the, the scriptures, the spirit, and the son. The son, the spirit, and the scripture. And you, and you, and you, and you braid these three together. And you get this holy braid of hearing in experiencing and God and being rooted in the truth. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> I believe in this season, um, the Lord is restoring this to the church. Amen. I know He's restoring it here. Because we, we love the Scriptures. Uh, we love the, script, the, 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 the Son that the Scriptures talk about. And we love the Spirit who inspired the Scriptures. And we don't love the Scriptures to the point of denying the Spirit and the Son. And we don't love the Son to the point of denying the Scriptures and the Spirit. And we don't love the Spirit to the point of denying the Son and the Scriptures. There's a holy braid, and there's a tension that has to be managed. And there, there is a, there, there, there's a weighing of Scripture and what God is speaking in this day, in this hour, and what, what, what the Spirit is speaking. Now, we don't want to move the ancient landmarks as it as the Lord has spoken before. And there are landmarks that will not be moved by the Lord. However, there is the living, breathing Spirit that illuminates the Scriptures and reveals Jesus to us. Is this, is this, is this making sense? All right. So, so this is, this is what I, I believe the Lord is doing. Now, this is what the apostles walked in, the first apostles. The, 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 the 12 apostles, they, they knew Jesus. They knew Him very clearly. They saw Him. They lived with Him. They walked with Him. But it wasn't until He died and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven that the Spirit illuminated who He truly was, and they began writing the first letters that would become our New Testament. It took the Spirit to people who had met Jesus. It took the Spirit to reveal what all the Hebrew Bible actually meant in a way that was applicable to the man Jesus Christ. Amen. 
They could not do it without the Spirit. And so these people who knew Jesus experienced the Spirit and wrote Scriptures. So the Scriptures don't replace the Spirit or Jesus. And knowing Jesus does not replace the Spirit or the Scriptures. And no, uh, you, you, you hear me. The Holy Spirit is still alive. And, he's, and there's this threefold cord we want to continue to manage. And as Spirit-filled folks, we have really done a poor job of this in the last 25 years. And, and, I'm, and I will say, I will say, the root of a lot of it has been money. The root of a lot of it has been <clears throat> um, wanting, uh, uh, forget I said that. Let's just not say that. Let's just not go down that road. Is that okay? Let me say it this way. My wife was looking to do um, a small group. She was looking for a small group curriculum, right? And uh, I love, I, 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 I'm critical of people speaking, uh, I'm critical of some things, but I, I, I'm critical like family. Like, like, you know, like if you have children, you're like, I really wish they'd clean the room. I don't love them any less, though. They're still family. But I am so annoyed that they keep pooping on themselves. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to keep wiping them, but you're so annoyed with them. But you're annoyed in the way that family can be annoyed with family. Does that make sense? So I'm critical of our, our, our Pentecostal charismatic family, but they're still our family, right? They still love Jesus. They love the Holy Ghost. They want to see people get healed and the miracles come and heaven come on earth. Like, so we're still family, but I'm like, oh, can we just clean these things up a little bit? So my wife is, uh, you know, all these people that we love, they put out these small group curriculum. My wife's like, man, these are all good, but are there any spirit-filled folks who have small group curriculum that's based on Instead of your revelation, how about the Bible? Can we, can we get any small group, spirit-filled, Pentecostal, small group curriculum that actually is based on the Bible? Like, have, like do, 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 can we dust off the Bible and can we just... And you know how hard this was. You know how hard it was for her to find a scripture. It wasn't just like, you know, I had a dream one day after having Wheaties and then I had this visitation and now I'm going to do a six-week study on being all you could be. You can overcome this year. I wrote a book about it because... By you buying my book, I'm going to overcome, right? Like, <laughs> I didn't say that out loud. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I want to sell books. That's the funny part. That's really the funny part. Amen. And it'll, <laughs> I'll use the Bible in writing it. Oh. First service, they didn't start my clock, and it was so cool. And they started on time this time. Okay, so what happened to these people who knew Jesus and had the Spirit come? We see in Acts chapter 2. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This, this, this is where the church, this is where Jesus wanted to center the church. This is communion, community, and covering. Community, communion, covering. They lived life together. They commune with Jesus at the table and in their conversations, they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to the teaching of the apostles. Like, this is what the church was founded on. This is what started this thing. This is the people we owe our salvation to. These are the people who carried the faith in the midst of persecution. These are the people who said, no, 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 we cannot deny the, the Lord that we have met. They didn't they didn't give themselves to just good teaching. They didn't give themselves to political teaching, not to economic teaching, not to marriage teaching. They gave themselves to the apostles' doctrine. This is what they gave themselves to, the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they learned from Jesus, and that's what they taught. And, and it's important as we get re-centered. Wow, I am getting rocked up here. <clears throat> they, taught what Jesus, they, they taught what Jesus taught them. This is, this, is, this is super, super, super important. The Spirit will speak to you what Christ has for you in this day and hour, but that does not change who Jesus is and what he was called to do. Amen. Okay, Jesus told us what he was called to do. He made it clear. He, he spoke it out of the Torah, and he read it to us in Luke. Excuse me, out of, yeah, out of the Torah. He, he spoke it, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why did the Spirit come upon Jesus? He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I've talked to the to leaders about this. This is what Jesus came for. 
And what we experience in our life is, as we live life and as we grow older, we go through this cycle. We go through a cycle uh, of, of, of construction, deconstruction, reconstruction. Construction, deconstruction, reconstruction. We believe something with all our heart and with all our soul, and then some new information comes. And then we have to figure out, how do I fit this new thing into what I already believe? So we got to kind of deconstruct thing, some things. we got to take some things apart. We had it all figured out. Remember when you knew everything? Remember in your teens, possibly, you just knew everything. Right? Like maybe your parents knew nothing, but you knew everything. Remember that? Remember there was a season of life where you just thought everybody was stupid and you had everything figured out. Maybe, I remember, you know, eh, I don't want to go down that road. But we started thinking that we know more than the, than the, like the past. Like, he's, if he just did this or they just did this, then we would, and you're like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, now I get it. I remember when I started as an outreach this church, I knew everything about leading a church. I just knew everything. And I used to make some bold, bold proclamations. Look, we are just going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not doing anything else. We're not doing any social stuff. We're not doing children's ministry. We're just preaching the gospel. And then you're like, wow, people want to know where the front door is. You might want to put someone outside to like point them and, I don't know, greet them. And we had, we, we had greeters, but you know, we didn't want to call them greeters. And we're like, well, might as well call them a greeter because then people know what it is. And then all of a sudden, kids were being very loud in the service, and people were like, I'd love to come to your church, but, you know, I have kids. I'm like, hmm, oh, that's why they have children's ministry. It's not actually a distraction. They actually know better than I did, right? So there's this deconstruction of what you thought you knew and a reconstruction. Are, are you following me? And in our lives, sometimes it feels like what we knew was being destroyed and we lost our faith. When really the Lord is deconstructing some things He didn't want you to bring into the next season. He's like, that was good for that season, but I need you to tear that down for what I want to do in the next season because I'm trying to build something new in your life. And so there's things that the church did in a, in a, in a phase of construction where we said, oh, the Spirit has come now. And there gets this overemphasis and the Lord's like, that's good, but I need to deconstruct some things so I can reconstruct what your real call is and get you back to the purity of your relationship with Jesus. And so you may feel like I lost some things. I, 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 I was to be pure in my faith, and now I don't know. Praise God. Don't run from that season of I don't know. Say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe the Lord is deconstructing some things that I thought were truth but really weren't. Now I'm inviting Jesus to come in and give me the real truth so I can reconstruct a stronger faith that doesn't fall apart in testing. Amen. 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 You want to welcome Jesus into these seasons. Don't run from him. He's not scared of your doubts. He's not scared of your disappointment. He's, he's not. He's not worried about it. As a matter of fact, he probably knew it was coming before you did. And in the midst of it, he's still God. He's still God. The God who saved you is still the God in that season of not knowing. The key is saying, okay, I'm gonna, I, I got to know what's true and I got to hold on to what I know to be true. And other things like, man, the Lord is deconstructing them. And it can be scary yeah. to find out that what we held as truth and as dogma, as is unquestionable, starts getting a little questionable. Now, we're not talking about the ancient landmarks. We're not talking about, is Jesus Christ God? Was he born from a virgin? Do, is there no other way to the Father than through Jesus? That's, that's clearly, that's never going to change. Nobody is writing another book of the Bible. Right? That's just unchanged. That's just, we, we, know that, we know that's going to be true, but almost everything else is up for debate. <laughs> what is God speaking to you? There's a deconstruction and a, and a reconstruction that happens. And that's scary to some people. This very thought is scary to some people because they've just like, give me all the answers. And I, 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 I'm, it's, I'm sorry, the world's just not that sure. It's, it's just not that fixed. It's not, it's not all decided already. And, and we live a life that is in flux. But we can trust Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. We don't need to build man-made walls where God has not built walls. We don't need to set up barriers where God has not built barriers. Where Holy Spirit says, I will keep them. You don't need to come up with legalism to keep them. I will keep them by my Spirit. And I feel like the church in this day and age is going through deconstruction. I feel like the church is going through deconstruction right now. And, and in deconstruction, it's like those, like those pictures I talked about where you have to lose your focus to get the big picture. And I feel like we focused on some things that aren't the main focus. 
And we need to get a little fuzzy so we can see Jesus again and what he has to do with everything. Sometimes the church gets distracted by looking at things other than Jesus. The church started in the presence and power of God, and it wanted surety. And so we came up with rules and laws and even doctrines that said we don't need to hear God anymore. Even doctrines that say I don't have to trust that God is coming into healing people. If they die, it was God's will. Because that is sure and it's comforting. It's just a lie. Amen. Amen. It's just a lie. God wants to heal people. But why doesn't God heal everybody? I don't know. That's the flux I'm talking about. And we have to surrender to not always knowing what's going to happen. There are things that the church has focused on that are not Jesus. Now, I'm going to say a couple things, and I don't want you to amen me until I'm done. I don't want, I don't want you to get half a picture before I say it all. There are social gospel works that people have focused on over Jesus. Don't say anything yet, please. The church... There's issues of sexuality that, that, that want to distract you from Jesus. I, I'm hearing a lot of like my like fellow conservative Christians telling me that the social gospel is a false gospel. I'm like, you don't think we should end abortion? That's a social gospel. That is, that is championing the least of these. If, if you're not sure if Jesus is for the fetus in the womb, I have to say, have you, have you met him? Have you met him? If you don't know if he's for the hungry, i got to ask you, have you met him? If you don't think that he's championing those who are the least of these, you got to ask you have, you, have you met him? Is he about a social gospel? Of course he is, because he's for people. I am pro-life. I'm pro-life from conception to natural death and if you're breathing i'm for you staying alive amen that I'm, I'm for you staying alive well pastor don't you think there's times that people to know I, I can't agree with anybody getting shot i'm sorry that i just i just happen to be pro-life i'm pro-life i just i'm sorry i don't i don't it's just where i'm at i'm for people staying alive that's not my point, though. I just want to point that out there. I'm pro-life. I, uh, I get to hear God with people. I was having a conversation with someone recently, and it really, 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 I knew it was God talking to me. They were talking about, they were, we were having a conversation, and they were telling me how they're reaching all these people who live in same-sex attraction. Now, I, I personally, what God has revealed to me for my life and the people that I pastor and disciple, that physical sexual intimacy is reserved in a lifelong covenant with a man and a woman in the hope of having children, right? Like that's, that's my, that's what I believe as I talk to God, that's what I believe to be truth. And so people with, um, maybe who live in a, uh, with an alternate reality, I'll say, uh, want to make the gospel about that issue. They want to say, well, what do you think about gay marriage? Well, what do you think about, don't you think it's the new civil rights movement? Don't you think, like, well, we're not moving what the center of the truth is from anything other than Jesus. The center of my faith is Jesus. Well, what do you think about, what do you think about same-sex marriage? I don't think about it at all, to be honest with you. I'm just married, <laughs> and I plan to stay in the way. Let's talk about Jesus. Well, what do you think about gay marriage? Nothing. I don't think about it at all. What I do think about is staying faithful to my wife because we're married. Have you thought about saving yourself until you're married? As Jesus, let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about, are, are you hearing me? Well, what about the environment? What, 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 wait, what, what about the environment? Well, God was, let's, oh, wait, are we talking about the same Jesus? Let's just make sure we're talking about the same religion before we talk about the environment. Like, I want to talk about the environment and I believe in the garden God told us to take care of this planet. It's pretty clear in the Bible he told us to take care of the planet. Like, that means something. But if you're not a Christian, then this whole conversation is irrelevant. We're just talking about environmentalism. We're not talking about Christianity now. <clears throat> I 
This is, this, this is not always popular, believe it or not. There was a time in the church that instead of talking about environmentalism, they talked about debt. And if you had any debt, you were in sin. You weren't allowed to get married unless you didn't have debt. Like, if you spent more, you went on a vacation, use your credit card. Does that sound, it sounds kind of silly for me to say that, right? Anybody? That sounds silly, right? That for, that to be the, that for that to be the center of a, of a sermon sounds silly. And you're just like, why would that be the center? Because the church gets distracted. And the church is being distracted today on things that are not Jesus Christ. Now we're like, of course it's wisdom that you don't want to go into debt, but let's not, let's not make that the center of our salvation. We go through this construction, deconstruction, and reconstruction in our lives, and the church is going through it right now. What is the church really here for? It's to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way in Acts chapter 20. He says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Say any. Anything that was profitable in teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, this is the gospel. This is the gospel, friends. Let me sum it up for you right here. This is what they did. They publicly taught what is profitable. Turn to God and put your faith in Jesus. Turn to God and put your faith in Jesus. I, early in my walk, Christians had their faith in money. Now I'm watching the church put their faith in politics. And I'm like, put your faith in Jesus. Let's come back to Jesus. I have a weird hobby. I have, I have several weird hobbies. I watch, um, I watch Marine Corps receiving videos where they first receive the new um, en enlistees in the Marine Corps. I don't know why. I almost know the speech. There is a scripted speech that the drill instructor comes in and he gives. I, I could begin to give it to you right now, but I don't want to. And what they, what, what they tell the recruits is, what they tell the recruits is, what you need is you need to be focused and you need spirit to make it through boot camp. Spirit. How many of you know they're not talking about the Holy Ghost of God's spirit? And as I was kind of chewing on this, I had a conversation with someone who happened in our church who happened to be an officer in the Marine Corps. And he's like, they kept talking about the spirit of the Corps. And I finally figured out they're not talking about the same spirit I'm talking about. I need to get out of this thing, right? Like... And I said, yes, there is a spirit that will come and mask the Holy Spirit. And if enough people agree that this is the real spirit, then we get caught up in something that actually denies Christ. Friend, I don't want to be a Christ denier. I want Jesus Christ to be the center of what I'm doing this year. Are you tracking with me? Are we on the same page here? <clears throat> what, what the church was founded on, we're, we are going to return to. And I think there's a prophetic word for the church, but this is a prophetic word for Revival Life Church, if no one else. How, how are we going to see this? How are we going to see this? <clears throat> Paul said, I did not shrink from declaring anything that was profitable. When you're lost, when you feel like your faith has been deconstructed, when you're not sure what to do, when you're not sure in the midst of someone trying to move the goal line, in saying that salvation or Christianity or relationship with God is some other thing, or you feel like, I don't know where I'm going. Let, let me tell you this. Your testimony, we can find Jesus in our testimony. When we don't know where he's at or what he's talking about, speak your testimony again. Where you found him originally is where you will find him again. He is still there in the midst of your testimony. And so when people say, well, what do you think about gay marriage? Say, I don't know, but let me tell you this. I used to be a depressed guy who thought he knew everything. And then one day I met Jesus. I met Jesus and all of a sudden my life, me, Carl Thomas, my life got more clear. And all of a sudden it was easy to see Jesus. So I don't know about this gay marriage thing. I don't know, but I do know where you can find him and the one who can tell you the answers. Well, I heard the church has done this thing in persecution in the 1700s. Like, 
I remember when the devil was persecuting me and I was under depression and anxiety and I could not control my life. And then I met the man Jesus. And all of a sudden, my life got a little bit more clear. Right? We can get in a, we can get in a depression and be like, God, I thought you were going to bring me kids this year. My business was going to prosper or my ministry was going to grow. Or and then you just say, oh, wait a minute, what, am I, what is the goal line now? Is the goal line what I came up for in this year? Or is the goal line the salvation that Jesus Christ has brought me through His shed blood on the cross? All of a sudden, I'm like, yeah, no, but I remember. I remember when I didn't even have goals. I didn't have godly goals because I didn't know Him. And then I met the man, Jesus. And He came, and He came to me, and He said, Carl, if you put your faith in me, I will give you new life. Amen. Your testimony is a sure path home. We find Him in our testimony. We miss Jesus in the simplicity of life. We complicate the simple gospel. And we confuse our struggle with following Jesus. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 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 Come on up, Mike, if you would. If you're, Mike's still here? Yeah, come on up, Becky. Thank you. <clears throat> So 2020, we're going to find Jesus again. Personally and corporately, we're going to find Jesus again. You're like, I never lost him. Amen. We're going to see him more clearly. Because <laughs> I want to see him more clearly. Because there's a spirit of the world that wants to tell me what I need to focus on. And I need the spirit of God to give me clarity in Jesus. Next Monday, we're going to start our 28 days of seeing Jesus clearly. We're going, to, we're going to work our way through the book of Matthew. And you're like, we're going to read one chapter a day for 28 days. Guess how many chapters are in Matthew? Anybody want to guess? 28. What? Can you imagine? Can you, can you believe that, they, that God had him write this book, the exact number of chapters that was going to be in our devotional? Isn't that? And they deny there's a God. Come on, man. How do you explain that? There's two ways to read the scripture. We've talked about this. There's informational where you read a lot and you just get the information. Then there's reading it for formation where Christ will be formed in us. We're going to read the Bible slowly. One chapter a day. We're going to meditate on the scriptures looking for Jesus so that he can be formed on the inside of us. <clears throat> and I believe as we do this, the Lord... He's going he's gonna to bring us some clarity. He's going to revisit some dreams that have since kind of gone out in our lives. Some flames that are now kind of smoldering. I believe the Lord is going to bring forth some things that we have stopped praying for. He's going to add new life to them. The Lord began talking to me and reminded me of something. I don't, I don't think I ever shared this um, I don't, share, I don't believe I've ever shared this testimony. It was just so holy. When we, a number of years ago, just doing an outreach, and we were in somebody's living room, and uh, the place would just be packed. But early on, there was a, a girl who had gotten, gotten really radically touched by God. And uh, she um, didn't get touched at our outreach, but around the same time she got touched. And she would come every, I think it was Tuesday night we used to do it originally. And, uh, and her sister was a drug addict. And uh, we would pray for her sister, like we would pray. We would pray for her sister. And uh, then she got her sister to come. And her sister was coming just so she would stop bugging her. And uh, I was preaching in like the living room of this house. And I looked through the window and I could see the front of the house. And the girl had kind of dipped out of the meeting. Um, and I saw her through the window hanging on to this piano. Like, I was like, what the heck is happening? What happened was she tried to leave and the Lord had arrested her and wouldn't let her leave the house. She could not physically walk out of the house. The presence of God was so strong upon her. And she came back and she got radically delivered and saved. I mean, just gloriously, gloriously delivered and saved. She got baptized in the Holy Ghost, of course, and heaven got open to her. And she began seeing like angels and demons and she was starting to preach the gospel everywhere and she was had just enrolled in some rehab program uh, and right when right when she got 
right when she started coming to us. And so she went to this rehab program, and they had never seen anybody come out of addiction so powerfully and so cleanly before. They were just... <clears throat> and so because of that, they paid for her to go to Christian college. They, she got a full scholarship to go to a Christian college. And that's like, you might be like, that's awesome. Well, she didn't know that they were cessationists. And they sent her to a fundamentalist Baptist college. Now, if that doesn't mean anything to you, imagine having to wear pantyhose and skirts everywhere you went and not being allowed to talk to anybody of the opposite sex or it was fundamentalist. And uh, they were cessationists, of course. And here's a girl who just got radically delivered from drugs, radically saved, prophesying, casting out demons in this cessationist thing where they told her, you're not allowed to talk about the Holy Ghost. This is a true story. And so there she is talking about the Holy Ghost in this uh, Christian college and where they were telling them that the gifts of the Spirit had stopped. She's casting devils out of people in the room. People would come to her, her dorm room and be like, I can't stop doing this. And she'd cast the devil out of them and they would get set free. Now she had been saved for a couple months. And I don't know if you remember when you got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I couldn't shut up either, right? Like, I didn't, I didn't, like, and so she's, you know, casting the devil out of people. She's prophesying over folks, getting people set free. And then they decided they were going to get themselves free from her. And the guy kicked her out of the school. And uh, so she came back, back to South Florida after she had been kicked out of this college. And I was like, well, let's run with God. And uh, then... She thought she received a blessing. This dude shows up in her life. And don't you know the devil would do something like that, right? Don't you know how he'll, he'll do you, right? Like, I'm on fire for God. Bring a distraction right in your face. And this girl who had been so set free from drugs and alcohol got on fire for God, got a, got a scholarship to a Christian university. In a matter of weeks, it was all gone. It's one distraction. And so the Lord began to bring that story back up to me and that had been a real it had been a sense of pride and a sense of grief I know that since then she's you know reconnected with her family and but I think often what could have been what could have been for that life and I and the truth is we had an outpouring a wave came and we weren't ready we hadn't gotten ready we didn't know how to get ready we didn't we didn't have any idea how to get ready for the outpouring that was happening and so so much of it what would came to be a blessing and empower and establish something really just destroyed. Now, I'm thankful that people got saved and set free and God did so much in that that we didn't have a tsunami. We actually had a wave, but we weren't ready. And the Lord began to tell me, better get ready. It's time to get ready for the outpouring. And I believe the Lord brought that story up to me again that I had never shared from the pulpit in this church because we're going to begin seeing that again. Amen. Amen. We're going to begin seeing that again. Except this time, they're actually going to get discipled. They're actually going to have somebody pour into them. Somebody going to teach them the Word of God. Going to be bold enough to say, I can't withhold any good thing from you. You need to stay single-minded in this season. Right? Like, 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 let's not get distracted from what God is doing on the other things that look like a blessing, but are really just a distraction. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 The other thing I believe that's really coming is there's going to be a prophetic sharing of Jesus. I believe there's a prophetic activation for evangelism that's going to be poured out again on this house. A prophetic activation. I'm talking when the Word of God is in you and you can't help but share it with people. <clears throat> again, I get to live life with people. This is... The Lord reminded me, this is, this, is, this is how our own Corey Pagano, who's now a minister in this house, someone had prophetic unction fall upon them, and it just happened to be a co-worker of his. And in the middle of a shift, at a job, shared a prophetic word with him. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Corey and reactivated a faith that had been quiet since childhood. Glory of God came, from, came upon Corey. He's never turned back since. That's the power of the prophetic word. Yeah. Amen. That is the power of the prophetic word. And I believe the Lord is going to be releasing that beginning today. Amen. Stand with me if you would. 
before we, before we go, I felt like the Lord said, we're going to need to, no, let me, let me say it differently how he told it to me. We need the fire to be burning in the burning room. The fire came on Friday night in the burning room. It was, it was good. It was good. And the Lord told me to pray for some people this morning. Now we see there in Acts 20, 20. They not only were sharing Jesus in the temple, in the synagogues, but house to house. And I feel like this anointing that's coming is going to be on you to share in your conversations at the workplace, at Walgreens, as we share people with people the word of the Lord and tell them where to come and receive life and discipleship. Amen? That's upon us in this year. But before we, before we part, I felt like the Lord told me we're supposed to pray for a couple of things today. Now, hear this. <clears throat> the Lord said we need to pray for those who need a financial miracle. Now, hear what I mean about this. I don't mean like, you know, my car is on its last leg and I'd like a better car. Like, I'm in there, right? Like, I would like a better car. But a financial miracle is like, I don't have money to pay my rent. Chronically. I don't have money to pay for a medical procedure that I need. I can't afford my medication. Like, I, I'm not sure how I'm going to feed my children in two weeks. And we pray for this last service. We're going to pray for this again, this service. And if you're in that place right now, you need a financial miracle. You chronically are unemployed or underemployed to the point where it is affecting your ability to keep a house. If that's where you're at, put up one hand if you would. And don't, don't be embarrassed. Put up one hand if you would. There's people on the right here. Someone in the back. Anybody else? You need a financial miracle in your life. If you're near them, the Lord has appointed you right over here on the left. Is that? Yes? If you're near them, the Lord has asked you to be their prayer team today. Amen. So if I can have a couple people gather around, do me a favor. Don't walk across the church because we're going to pray for other people in our house. If you're near them, you're going to pray for them. If you're not near them, we're all going to pray, though, for financial miracles over the people of this house. People are having babies and don't know how they're going to pay for the babies. And that's wrong. That's, that's injustice. That is injustice. And we're going to pray that good news will come to the poor. That good news will come to the poor. Someone gave me a vision from last uh, service that this good news is the provision of God for whatever you need. Salvation, finances, health. Peace. So I want you to begin praying. And here's how I want you to pray. I want you to pray as if your children were hungry and looking at you and the cupboards were bare and you weren't sure how you're going to feed them that night. How would you pray that God would come and meet your need? I wouldn't mumble. I would cry out. I would be crying. So I want you to pray right now for financial miracles for the people in this house. Financial miracles right now in the name of Jesus that you would bring break, that you would bring breakthrough Break through Jesus. We say this is injustice. This is injustice. You are the son of righteousness and you will rise with healing. And you will bring breakthrough in this area. Come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Come on. Enter into this prophetic unction right now. Enter into this prophetic unction right now. Yeah, that's it. Come on. Come on, lean in. Ten more seconds, come on. Shaka baka baka tedede. Good job. Amen. Amen. Keep that in prayer. The second thing the Lord told me to pray for in this service was um, broken families. Estranged families. Families that have had separation come into them. And we need the gospel to come and heal families. So if there is separation, maybe you have a, a son or daughter who is 
a prodigal. I don't mean just away from the Lord, but there's a, bro- there's a fracture in your relationship. Possibly there's a, a parent that you're separated from or uh, a brother or sister that has broken off from the family. I believe the Lord wants to heal that. And I believe he wants to use us. Wow, I feel the anointing on that really strong. Wow. I just feel like the Lord is mourning with those who mourn. Again, if there's a fracture in your family and you need God to come and heal it, if you raise your hand, just raise one hand. I'd like to have people pray with you. Amen. See it over here? Here, so look for the hands. And when you have like two people, two or three people near you, I want you to put your hand down. But don't put it down until you have two or three people around you. Right over here. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, go ahead and pray. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, that you would restore the breach. Bring restoration where there is separation, Lord. Bring that healing salve. Come on, pray pray prophetically. Just don't tell them what to do. But pray. Pray, pray, pray. Pray. Heal families, Lord. Heal families, Jesus. Heal families, Jesus. Heal families, Jesus. What sin has broken, you can heal, Lord. What sin has broken, you can heal, Lord. What sin is broken, you can heal, Lord. What sin has broken, you can heal. Give me 10 more seconds on that if you would. All right. All right. All right. All right. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job, church. Good job, yeah. Before we, before we break today, I want to pray for everybody in this room for an activation, a prophetic activation in our lives. Whoa. Ha. Huh. Whoa. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Look at that right there. How about that? How about that? I just feel like there is, like, the Lord brought up this girl because he wants to multiply that now. And what looked like it was dead, he's multiplying in this season. And I don't know who in here wants that. But I'm going to pray, and I want you to ask the Lord for a prophetic anointing to speak the word of the Lord, not withholding any good thing from those who need to hear it. And that you would have the word of the Lord that would set people free, where you have debated people, and you've argued with people, and you've tried to convince people. The prophetic word of the Lord comes. The prophetic word has God on the breath. You're speaking, but it's the Holy Ghost that's moving. Where you're trying to, where you're trying to do your best and, 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 and your words were just landing on the intellect, this is going to land on the spirit man. This is going to land on the spirit man. So let's just begin to pray that right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, touch me with this anointing. Pour it out on me in an importance of the gospel in this hour, the importance of sharing the gospel in this hour, Father, that you're, mm, come on, just pray it, pray it, pray it, pray it, pray it. Restore restore, restore my passion, restore my hunger, Father, and double the anointing, double and triple the anointing, open heavens, come on, pray it out, pray it out, open heavens above me, Jesus, that I may cast out demons, that I may see angels blessing people, that I may give out spiritual gifts, that I may introduce people to Jesus. That at my words, heaven would open and they would be ushered in. Come on, pray it. Pray, 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 pray. Don't think it. Use words. Don't think it. Use words. Jesus, that you would touch me and pour it out on my life. I just... Come on, I see a harvest. 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 I need you to see it. I'm saying it over and over because I need you to see it. Shaba, look, 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 look. You can see it. I see a harvest. You see it. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? I see a harvest. Do you see it? I see a harvest. Do you see the harvest? Do you see the harvest? There it is right there. Do you, wow, do you see the harvest? Duke, do you see the harvest? Do you see it, Chelsea? Do you see the harvest? Cecilia, do you see it? Do you see the harvest? Do you see the harvest, Zoe? Do you see it? 
You have to see the harvest, Brianna. Come on, do you see it? Do you see it, Mike? Do you see the harvest? You have to see the harvest. It's calling. It's calling. Who will come for us? Who will come for us? Who will come for us and speak every profitable thing? Who will come and speak the word of the Lord? Who will come and not allow me to move the goalpost and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Who will center the story on Jesus in my life? Who will come? Who will come and rescue me? Like the word of the Lord that came and saved my life. Shakaba. Shakaba. I was sitting there debating somebody, thinking I was being clever. And then the Lord breathed on his word and my heart was pierced. Jesus, that we would surrender to your spirit this year. And you would speak through us and we'd stop arguing and we'd start preaching. Under the unction of the Holy Ghost, not what we think is, 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 is primary, but what your spirit is speaking. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Come on, can we rejoice in that? So good. Thank you, Jesus. There's just such a sweet presence here this morning. I just keep seeing, I just keep seeing Holy Spirit just stirring the pot. Just some, something's cooking, something's happening in our midst, amen. And I'm excited about it. Hey, listen, a couple things. First thing, this week, this week we're, we're gonna respond to the message this morning by sharing our testimony with somebody. Got a couple amens. This week, we're going to respond to the word this morning by sharing our testimony with somebody. Amen. Amen. Second thing, our 28 days of devotion is, is coming up, I believe, starting next Sunday, correct? Next Monday. Starting next Monday, you can go on Facebook or on our website and sign up to receive those daily devotionals. Um, so you, it's there now on Facebook. So you can go find the link. You sign up, put your email in. You're going to get it sent to your inbox every day. And you're going to go through Matthew with us. We're going to read the book of, of Matthew together. And uh, it's going to be good. I don't know about you, but I need a fresh revelation of Jesus in my life this year. Amen. Can we give it up for Jesus one more time this morning? God bless you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Have an amazing Sunday. Enjoy this weather. And we'll see you next week.